Welcome to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. This is Chris Miller. I invite you to join me as I interview artists from a variety of disciplines. We'll share powerful stories and lessons learned while making their art. Good day. This is Chris Miller with the Spiritual Artist Podcast, and I'm your host. Today's guest is Alex Cook. He is an artist, musician, and writer who resides in Boston, Massachusetts. Since 1997, Alex has created over 200 murals in 20 states and four countries, including the United States, Kenya, Nigeria, and Guatemala. His work focuses on community and spiritual themes expressed through nature, imagery, and storytelling. He has a You Are Loved mural project. To date, there are 80 You Are Loved murals in 13 states and two countries. They are in schools, homeless shelters, prisons, worship communities, and more. Today's conversation will include the release of his recent book, You Are Loved, Spiritual and Creative Adventures. It's kind of a dreary, forlorn day here in Dallas, Fort Worth, but I have some, an exciting guest. Um, Part of my journey is realizing the synchronicity of life and how once you start doing something in your life, you realize that everything that preceded it came to this one point. Every experience that you have, whether it was a bully on the playground when you were in eighth grade, all the way through how you treated college. And so it was really exciting when Alex reached out to me and asked about my show. He heard my podcast and he is an artist. He's a musician. He's a writer. He is a very interesting person. I was so excited that he reached out to me, but the synchronicity was amazing. And so I went out immediately and ordered his book very different from the spiritual artist book. He comes from such a personal perspective. And so Alex, I'd like to introduce you and have you tell people a little bit about about your art, how you started out in art, also that you do music, and now this book. So uh, good morning, Alex. How are you? Good morning, Chris. I'm just fine. Uh, Grateful to be here. Um, Yeah, uh, you know, my creative journey goes way back to when I was a kid and I just loved making pictures. And um, as I got a little older, I I became very interested in, you know, expressing myself, expressing the ideas that were important to me. And as that, uh, you know, turned into a career and, and, you know, multiple decades of of making art, it just has developed into, you know, primarily a a fascination with ideas where the... um, the medium is kind of secondary. The idea is first, and then sometimes, and then the idea tells me how, you know, this should be expressed as a mural, or this should be expressed as a song, or this should be expressed as a poem, or this is gonna go into the book, you know? So I don't really think of myself as a practitioner of a particular medium. I love ideas, and those ideas come out in a broad array of media. Well, you know, I love love that because I always uh, I talk about people, um, I work on the spiritual plane and that's where ideas are. You know, ideas are up there on the spiritual plane. Yep. And so I know this is gonna be a great conversation. <laughs> I, I was telling, you know, as I read through your book, I was highlighting and pulling out <laughs> things and going, oh, wow, and, and loving it. There were parts that I, I was like, hmm, I love the word choice here, or what about this word choice? So I'm excited to talk about this, this book. Um, do you, can you explain a little bit? I know you started out in fine art and folks, I can't even um, begin to unpack the incredible journey Alex has had. Um, you have to get the book because <laughs> there are so many, Alex, really, you really are an outlier and, and the way you've lived your life doing so many interesting things from taking a bike and riding across state lines. And, and uh, I love the uh, story about wearing a costume and driving down the street. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like you did that for a great period of time. So um, could you tell them a little bit about the mural project that you do right now? Because I think that's a wonderful. Um... Yeah, so I've been painting murals for 20 plus years at this point. Uh, that was uh, my, my passion when I was graduating from college was I thought, you know, murals is, is what I really want to do, um, the way I want to express my ideas. And I did that for and continue to do that. Um, uh, but in 2014, after you know being a muralist for almost 15 years, um, I just had this this really beautiful breakthrough um, <clears throat> where 
Uh, I was working on a project in a school in New Orleans, uh, and the, the principal of that school had told me that they were, as a school, one of their projects was helping the kids feel more safe in the context of school. I think they had noticed that kids were not feeling safe, and obviously that was getting in the way of, of learning. And she said, you know, okay, uh, can you make a mural that will help our kids feel more safe? Um, and I thought, wow, that's a really serious thing to ask an artist to do, you know? Um, for my whole career, I have been trying to make works of art that will have, like you said, a spiritual effect on people, you know, a healing effect, a transformative, a comforting effect. So it was very, like, in my wheelhouse um, to be asked to, to make a work of art that would help these kids feel safe, but it didn't mean I knew how to do it. Um, so I was just standing there at my wall, you know, listening and praying, uh, you know, how can I do this? <laughs> uh, and 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 as as is true in in my best experiences of prayer, you know, a new idea came, and it was a question to me, and it said, uh, it said, why are you trying to be subtle about this thing that's so obvious? Because mm. uh, I had been thinking. You know what? What kind of a picture can I make that will help these children feel safe? And that question, you know, led me to think, well, what's obvious? And the thing, the, the thing that was obvious is people feel safe when they know that they're valued, when they know that they're loved, when they feel loved. Uh, and so the idea that jumped to mind was, what if we write the words "You are loved" on the wall of this school for kids to, you know walk past every day of their lives for the whole time that they're in this school. And that sort of blew my mind to think of writing something so intimate uh, in a permanent way in this public place. Uh, I thought, wow, can you really do that? Can you, can you write something <laughs> that intimate on, on a wall of a school? Uh, and, and because it felt so wonderful to me, I thought, you know, let's, let's really go with this. So I asked the principal, I said, what if we wrote? you are loved on the on the wall in the mural and she was into it and we so we developed the idea and that was the first you are loved mural that was back in in um 2014 and now it's been uh what eight years that uh it certainly has grown from that and become uh, you know it started off as that idea and now it's 80 plus murals around the country in 13 states and these huge murals that say that same phrase you are loved um in in all different kinds of scenarios, whether it be uh, schools or shelters or businesses or prisons, um, you know, it, it really has just grown and grown in my thought um, and consequently uh, has grown in its outward expression. And, and thank goodness, um, it has been really warmly received. Um, I'm happy to say, you know, it just keeps gaining momentum and, and uh, people are finding uses for these murals in their communities. So uh, first, I want to put a little bookmark back where you said you prayed and and heard something. We're going to go back to that later on. I love that, that you you listen for inspiration. And so that's a wonderful part. Um, yeah. And it sounds like, I do believe you've done some murals even here in Dallas-Fort Worth, I think in Plano. Is that right? I have, yeah. Yeah, I have, I have a... a mural at Clark High School in Plano and another at Sam Houston High School in Arlington and then one at a shelter downtown. That's so people can uh, if you read this locally you can actually go around and see these murals and actually you have a website with the murals a lot of murals up there. Uh, great sense of color and and I want to share something that I, I read in the book that I loved. Okay um, Alex I was in advertising for 25 years and so there's, there was a part there where you talk about doing the mural and you had to let go a little bit, um, you, you, you know, of your sense of control. You were, you, you know, you're a fine artist, you know how to do the painting, you know how to do the shading, and suddenly you're giving it to these youth and they're kind of doing their own thing, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I love that. And you had to kind of step back. It was, it was a little challenging, right? For sure, yeah. Um... About a little over 15 years ago now, um, I was led again in my prayers to to start this um, mural painting program for teenagers. This was around 2004, um, and uh, uh, I was, you know, 
doing the administrative stuff and finding the walls and seeking out funding for the project and finding the students to work with and just all the pieces of putting together this, this mural project, which was something I had never done and didn't have training for and was really learning how to do on the fly. So, uh, you know, all those things came together and I found myself with a group of students standing on the street uh, looking at our first wall. Um, and in many ways, it was, a, it was a, a big success to be at that point with the money to pay the kids and the wall and, you know, it all came together. Um, but I found myself there. And as you mentioned, I, I, I quickly found this really kind of strong tension um, which was that, that, you know, first and foremost, I, at that point, was a, a painter and really not a teacher. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but I had put myself, I had really been led, I think, uh, to put myself in the scenario where I was a teacher first and an artist second. Um, and I found myself in that place and, and it was pretty uncomfortable. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to like send the kids home and just make the mural myself, um, which was obviously wrong because, you know, I had all these people who had made donations to my project and, you know, just all, I, just, it obviously was not what I was supposed to do. But inwardly, I just, you know, I just love making paintings and that's what I wanted to do. So, uh, you know, especially over the first couple weeks of that summer project, just the sort of vice-like situation that I was in that wouldn't let me escape. Uh, I, I really had to discipline myself to let go of the desire to control the outcome and give in to what I knew was right, which was, you know, serving the students, being a teacher in that scenario, seeing my identity as a little bit more fluid, um, you know, seeing that right now I have to be a teacher and I have to set aside my desire to be a painter, you know, that'll, that'll be at different times. But right now, uh, I have to be a teacher. And it was pretty humbling, but also amazing after exerting that discipline on myself or really kind of giving into the discipline, I think is a better way of saying it, um, because it worked. You know, and I found myself growing and becoming a better teacher and becoming more fluid um, as I kind of overcame that willful desire to sort of be in control. Um, and especially as a person who prays, uh, you know, my sense of prayer is it works best when I'm not willful, when I'm not outlining how it has to uh, come in the world. But when I'm willing to go with the go with the spirit, go with the wind, you know, um, and in that case, it really panned out that way. You know, the outcome of that program was wonderful. I learned the kids learned um, wonderful projects got made um, and I got changed in a way that I certainly wouldn't have sought out. But that once it happened was very precious to me. Well, you know, what a spiritual lesson, right? I mean, learning to let go and let the process unfold and let spirit, so to speak, come through you and mm -hmm. let the out and not, you know, we all try to control that what's out pictured, right? We're all trying to get to that. And, and from years of in the advertising business, I learned slowly to let go and let the client have, have it's co-creation, right? It's mm -hmm. co-creating. And so it, it's a bit, it was a challenging lesson for me, Alex. So when I read it, I, I just underlined it and I was like, oh yeah, I, I know exactly how that feels. And, and I think, but I think you can get to a whole new level of creation. You get to a whole new level when you let go of that. I call it the little me, the, mm -hmm. the little I, the little Chris, and let that higher self and, and let it out picture in how it's meant to be. But um, and I noticed that even the, the styling of your, your murals, I think you said that now you grid them out. Um, so it gives the student an opportunity to have a, a piece of ownership. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, a, a big part of that, um, a, a big part of actually my growth much beyond that project, but, and, but into community projects of all types, which is now a big part of what I do, was you know letting go of a, of the total control and finding ways to involve others 
so that they do have that that feeling of ownership. Um, you know, it's one thing to come into a community as an artist, make a piece, and then leave. Uh, but it's a very different thing to come into a community, be in conversation with the community, listen to what they want, listen to the needs, and have them participate in painting, uh, you know, the mural. Um, when they do have this feeling of of ownership, uh, they're going to have a very different relationship to that work of art, and it's going to operate differently in their lives. Mm, I love it. I love it. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I wanted to move on and talk about your book. The book title is You Are Loved, Spiritual and Creative Adventures. Um, and, and then there's a subtitle, a memoir. Um, first, as I was saying earlier, when I introduced you, Alex, I really enjoyed the book. Um, and it's a big book. <laughs> it's a big book. I enjoyed reading it. That the, each chapter has a lesson and it shares something through a real life experience. Um, so many areas that we're going to talk about today. Hopefully, we have enough time. Um, I wanted to point out something that we we just started talking about feelings, and I've been kind of on uh, in my most recent podcast. I'm kind of on this journey of feelings and emotions, and and how do they, how do we use those in the creative process? But I have to tell you. I did love the entire book, Alex, but this one chapter, um, I, and it's called I Am an Artist. Wow. I, I mean, I, I really feel like the wording and the way you speak it was just so divinely inspired. <laughs> you know, it, it really yeah. was. And so I want to read just two paragraphs to the listeners because um, it's it's so wonderful. It's so poetic, this chapter. Um so I'm going to jump down a little bit, but it says, the kind of art I was interested in making was about my sincere feelings and convictions. Finding them, exploring and creating them was joyful and life affirming. After that, the demand was to somehow pour them out into the world. My sanguine longing hope was that these images that fed me the best things I'd ever found might do the same for someone else. But think of how people protect their feelings. Think of the lengths to which people go to keep their hearts safe, to hide their true feelings, to keep their sensitive parts safe from the judgment and scrutiny of callous eyes. Think of the defenses and armor that people use to avoid being rejected. My dream to bring my beloved visions into public places where they could do their work required that I simply not have those defenses. I, I, Alex, I, 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 I had to talk, when I was reading this, I did, I stepped back and just took a breath. <laughs> it's, it's such a vulnerable expression. I don't know even if you realize how how willing to be vulnerable you were in the writing of this book. I mean, mm -hmm. you really are. And the stories are so, like I said, they're zany from zany to heartfelt <laughs> and across the board. But that sentence just really moved me because it's true, isn't it? I mean, we all try, so many of us try to block our feelings or we try to hide from our feelings or hide our feelings from other people. Um, so, Going back to what we talked about with the mural project and working with your feelings, um, how do you use your feelings when you do the creative work? I mean, how much of, do you give into them? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, that has been just a navigation, <laughs> you know, over year after year after year after year. And it's my answer of what I do now is very different than what I did 10 years ago than what I did 20 years ago. Um, I think there has, I have made a lot of progress during that, that, those two decades um, where I feel like a lot safer as a person than I did maybe 20 years ago. Um, uh, so my relationship with feelings is different than it was, um, but they're, they're just, was and is a lot to navigate um, 
when it comes to our relationship with our feelings, especially when we're trying to do it in a creative work that has a public element where people are seeing mm. these expressions of our feelings. So let's just begin by saying like, it's a navigation and it can be hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, uh, I have always been uh helped along it's been an enormous blessing but it's also been very exacting that my feelings from long ago were very clear about the necessity to express beauty that was like a north star for me you know that was unmoving it would not change it was demanding it was a passionate fiery desire so that was a feeling that wasn't moving that was very compelling. But then at the same time, <laughs> the very same time, there's a terror of like, people are gonna hate my work, people are gonna not care about my work. Um, I'm just afraid in general, or, you know, just uh, lots of con conflicting feelings, which I think is normal for humans. You know, people have, have conflicting feelings. Um, And I have a sense that, you know, as we do this navigation, when we're honest and sincere and brave and, you know, live out virtues, live out the things that make life good, we, every once in a while, come to a place where we see that one of the feelings is stronger and more valid than the other. And we, as we said before, we let go of one of them and we hold on to the other. And so that's been a big part of my navigation is just staying in it, um, feeling all kinds of feelings. And honestly, you know, ultimately one of them just becomes more compelling than the other. And I think part of being spiritual, part of this spiritual world we're talking about is you realize that more and more you can be in control of what you hold on to and what you let go of. Um, that's a big part of spiritual practice to me, you know, learning year by year that the things that I feel, uh, I don't have to be ruled by all of them, you know, more and more I, I, I practice choosing, uh, which ones I actually love and which ones are maybe distracting me from what I love, um, and unifying myself more around what I love than what I fear. Uh, you know, I, I want more and more for my thoughts, my daily thoughts, my moment by moment thoughts, which of course become my life. I want those to be unified around what I love rather than what I fear. And that continues to be a daily practice, you know? Um, but I do think that's the direction that, that I've wanted to go and that has served me well. Uh, to, to unify my, my, my thoughts and feelings around, around what I love and be willing to let go of uh, things that are distracting from or pulling me away from, <clears throat> or sometimes feel like they have a magnetic pull away from, um, from what I really want, from what I really love. Uh, so that's a super simplistic way of describing a very, very complicated uh, process that has taken place over many, many years. You know, um, you're right. It is a complicated process. It's a nice level to get to, though. Um, uh, I've talked to other artists and other podcasts, and we talk about that you have to feel your emotions. Mm -hmm. but um, And you do. And, and there are emotions that come that are just part of being alive you know, the loss of someone in your life, um, tragedy, sickness. But <clears throat> I like what you're, you're saying there, which is as a spiritual artist, you can start navigating, navigating that a little better. Um, mm -hmm. a simple, I would say for me, it's as simple as not, I don't watch certain movies or TV shows because the energy, I just know right away, the energy isn't what I want. I don't want to see people bickering in a house, <laughs> you know, that that's not what I want to open my uh, life to. 
And so you're right. I can choose to just, just look away, you know, turn the other cheek is yep. really turn the other cheek is, is a way of saying, uh, don't look at that and look toward what, what does build your spiritual sense. I um, want to say too, that, uh, a, an indispensable part of that navigation for me is a sense of God, you know, a sense that there is a, a thing that loves me regardless, you know, absolutely without question. Uh, I don't know how I would be brave enough to, you know, face or defy or let go of certain things without an assurance that there is this, this rock that has care for me that isn't dependent upon whether I succeed or fail. Mm. That's certainly been, you know, the indispensable part of being able to navigate the whole broad spectrum of feelings from, from the lightest to the darkest. So I, I have to, I have to say, to say that. I, I love that. Um, uh, when I wrote my book, one of my earliest chapters is, is I call it moments of awe, but really what it's doing is it's telling you to seek out God, to see God in everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we see if, when we learn to see God in not just things, but in each other, you know, when you approach someone and you see God in them, it, and yourself, it just changes the whole game, mm -hmm. right? For sure. It just changes the whole game. And so, um, Beautiful, beautiful. Um, going on, going on with this feelings and and uh, you know I picked things out of your book <laughs> and highlighted them. So I'm going to jump uh, listeners to uh, a chapter called "Finding the Fountain: Christmas Revelation." But you talk a couple lines, and then I want to jump to another chapter, and we'll talk about this. Um, First, it was what I had always done. I poured my emotions into art. And then on, an, on another page, just a paragraph or two later, if my art wasn't about my feelings, what could it be about? Without them, it was, a, it was false, a lie, the opposite of beautiful. Without feeling, there was no good art. There was no song. Feeling is what makes art live. If my emotions are dead and can't support beauty, what do I have? How can I make anything worth making? I had no answer. Now, before I ask you to speak on that, Alex, I'm going to jump because I think in a way you kind of almost answer it again. You answer that question. Oh, probably way back later in the book. When you, when you talk about throwing off the, the pail or Paul, mm -hmm. um, Prayer is remembering that love is right where every threat screams and being more interested in love. I just, I thought that was the most, the best line. Prayer is remembering that love is right where every threat screams and being more interested in love. And I think it goes back to what we were just talking about. You have the choice to focus on one or the other. We, you know, I, and so how do you feel about that? Do you, do you, do you think that's what you were discovering here? And, and I held to those thoughts, I held to those good feeling thoughts of God. So, and, and we get back to this whole issue of goodness, because, you know, Alex, I don't know if you realize you use that word a lot. You talk about I'm good, or is it good? Or is this art good? My <laughs> goodness. So, so going with that stream of thought, is this kind of what you were doing when, with this, this realizing that there is something deeper than your feelings, that there's a relationship with God? Definitely. Uh, and the, the lesson that you were reading from, the one in the chapter called um, Discovering the Fountain, uh, you know, was, was such a shocking lesson to me. Um, I'll, I'll try to put it out there simply. You know, prior to that experience, I had had this feeling that I'm a person and I'm my job as an artist is to express myself. And by that, I meant express my feelings. You know, if I'm angry, I make an angry painting. If I'm happy, I make a joyful painting. Um, but during the time that that chapter is about, I was 
dealing with a deep and terrifying depression uh, where my feelings were, I found much to my surprise and chagrin, um, just had no life to them. They were just, it, it, I tried making paintings about them, but they, they, they were so dark and gross that there was nothing, there was no art in them. It didn't feel cathartic um, or substantial in any way to make paintings about the depression that I was feeling. It just felt like the, the tool that art had been to me was not a tool anymore. Uh, if I was using it to make expressions of that depression feeling. So I really felt adrift and lost that this tool that I had so deeply loved that had served me so well, kind of was broken in my hands. Uh, and so I, I really felt myself kind of stuck between a, a, a rock and a hard place, just, just nowhere to turn. Um, and I do think that again, spirituality um you know often in the darkest moments it kind of opens this third door we thought there were two options you know one or the other and spirituality you know as if by by magic but really because spirituality is real um has this way of opening a door for us where we thought there was no way to proceed and the the lesson was that when I recognized, when I really fully embraced that these emotions were incapable of supporting art, I just like turned away from them as a source for art, um, which was, you know, very scary to do, to abandon the thing that was familiar. Um, but necessity sort of showed that it had to be that way. And then the next step spiritually was that this fountain kind of opened up in my thoughts that was providing images, images that I loved, that were compelling to me and had meaning and substance. And they were just coming to me, not from, they were kind of the opposite of my feelings. They were so different than the emotions that I was having based on the way my life felt. And I describe it as a fountain because it just felt like it was this source of other ideas, a source that I hadn't known. Um, but once it sort of broke open and I had abandoned looking to my feelings to be the source, I became, you know, basically 100% invested in this new source that was entirely you know spiritual and and kind of unrelated to my daily life but very connected to my identity and my my substance as a being um and that became the thing that i looked to for for the images for my art basically from then on it was kind of like a faucet turned on and my my sense of my role as an artist and what I'm supposed to express really changed. Uh, and like I said, this was shocking to me. I had no idea that this was gonna happen, but it changed everything. Wow. So many artists rely on feelings. Um, and I think we're, we're all trained to that. And for me, it was a big step to realize, in my mind, I think of feelings as a tool. It's, it's one of the tools in my wheelhouse. But I always have the choice to choose it or not. But what I what you're speaking of here is so much deeper. Hmm. And so I need you, I need, I need, <laughs> I need you to, to to tease that out a little bit for, for the listeners and for me. Is it connection? Is it recognizing your connection to all that is? Is it your connect and including God? I mean, when I say all that is, I mean God. Is that what you're relying on now for for your inspiration and for your ideas? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, I mean, at some point along the way, I had the insight that basically anything that you see created anywhere that has value to it, God is its source. I don't really believe in humans as creators. Um, I believe that God is the creator of every 
good thing, whether it be a child's drawing or the songs of James Brown or, you know, the solar system or whatever. Like there's one creator and it's, and it's the source, it's love, it's the creative, you know, it's the, it's the perfect eternal artist. And we witness ourselves in our best moments, you know, uh, being reflections of that beautiful, amazing, fantastic source. Um, so, you know, when I see things, when someone tells me a joke, you know, and it makes me laugh, like that's a beautiful thing. And I, I, I mean, I don't do it moment by moment, but like I do recognize that God made up that joke. And so that's how I witness creativity in every form um, nowadays. And it's taken, uh, I, I didn't used to think that, uh, and I certainly couldn't have put it into those words, but, but it gives me a very confident sense that creativity is possible because, that's, because it's not my job. My job is just to be fascinated and interested and work. Um, and it really, I, I cling to that and, I, and I, I have made that my own because it has just taken the sense of burden off of creativity. It's just easy. <laughs> Creating is, is easy because I know that it's not my job uh, and I just receive and delight in the things that I find. Okay, so I love I, I once again I love hearing a different way of of explaining this. Um, I I think I'll go back to something you earlier said. I don't believe that it's that I believe that it is God through me, through me. So you know, through humans, through a child drawing the painting, um, uh, through me as me. Um, but I think you're right. I think all creativity, all creation is God. It, that's, that's what God is. It's create, creation. And, and um, I love when you, you talk about that. I, I had that experience myself. It was about surrendering to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, and that's why I don't pre-plan my uh, paintings and there's nothing wrong with pre-planning, but I love to just surrender to that spirit flowing through me and let the painting tell me what it wants to be. You know, I, I put the paint on there and suddenly through this inspired voice, and you know, we're going to move on to that, but through this, this inspiration, God, it just, it becomes what it wants to be. And maybe you could even say, let the, let the God in the painting, tell me what it wants to be. Let the spirit in the painting. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm always, like you said, I sit back and I go, oh, I don't, I don't have that burden. I, I you know, I, when I was raised, uh, Catholic and you know we're all about carrying the burden <laughs> Catholics are all about and and it's not my burden it's God is got me God's got it God's got this and and I relax and surrender into spirit knowing that it can't help but be beauty so I'm going to go all the way around to your word that when I surrender to it it it, it, it in, into the spirit it, it becomes something beautiful yeah yeah I agree. So I love this conversation because I, I have to tell you, I've talked to a lot of people. And when I wrote my book, this is where I'm coming from. And, and as I go out and speak to arts groups, uh, I see where a lot of people are on this discovery. And, and I love when I read your book, I was like, oh, oh, wow. He, yeah, he, he's, he's talking this. He's getting this. And, <laughs> and, it, and it was so fun because you do. You go back. The book, it takes a place over many years, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is your journey for like 20 years. Yeah. So, and I can't share, uh, listeners, I can't even share all the wonderful stories, um, uh, the parts where you've, you've gone into um, rehabilitation centers, you've served as a pastor. Uh, can you explain that a little bit, listening to prisoners and, and, walk, and helping them out? Um, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, many years ago, um, a, a friend of mine who had been involved in, in prison ministry at my church um, I guess he just saw in me that, that I might be good at this work. He was moving away. He asked me if I would take over for him in this work. And it was something that I had never thought about and was very surprising. Um, but, uh, this was, you know, I was maybe in my early thirties, mid thirties. I don't know. I, I just, in my desire to progress 
in my life. And because I had come out of this depression, um, I had this pretty strong rule that I held in mind, which was if an opportunity presents itself to you that seems like it has any substance, uh, you say yes to it. Um, so this opportunity came to me and I was like, wow, this <laughs> seems like really serious and cool and hard and I don't know how to do it. Um, but my rule was to, to say yes and be open to opportunity. So um, I said yes to him uh, and to, to make a long story short, it became seven wonderful years of um, working as a, as a volunteer chaplain in a jail here in Boston. Uh, where I did a lot of learning by doing, um, but very quickly found myself right at home. I just loved the work uh, in a way that I that I had not foreseen, but it just felt like home to me to be able to sit with these guys and just love them uh, and relate to them. And uh, you know, I learned so much about the scriptures that I was teaching from. I mean, in my personal life, I was like working and working and working to learn from them. Um, but, but you know, the, the axiom certainly goes that you learn the most by teaching, and I certainly did. Um, but also to see how being there, just being there with, you know, with some comforting scriptures and with the willingness to care and willingness to pray with these guys could just be so useful. I mean, nine out of 10 times I would walk out of the jail after my, you know, two and a half hour visit and just feel more useful than I did at any other point during my week. Um, you know, like having had some interaction with a guy who was terrified and I read him the 23rd Psalm in a voice that it's expressing my care for him and just seeing this guy become less afraid. Um, you know, and just countless experiences of that, having these conversations with people who are truly afraid or feeling so guilty or uh, trying to forgive themselves or trying to understand their relationship with God. You know, all these really sad, scary circumstances um, where I could actually just be a help. I feel like we all are just longing for ways to be useful, to help in the world. And that for me for seven years was it was like the most delicious meal <laughs> because I would go in and for two and a half hours, just be so useful because there was such great need. So it sounds to me like you were just in a way you go and you're just being present with these people and, and, and definitely. Yeah. I mean, and you know, when you're present, you bring with you all the tools that you have amassed over your experience until that point. So, you know, I had been working hard on my own life in all kinds of ways. Um, you know, in my own, my own prayers to understand life myself. So when I was present, I brought with me, you know, all of that work that I had done. Uh, and, and that certainly made me able to be useful uh, because of that, that work that had preceded it. And, and when you were doing that, did you somehow, did you often, I love, I love that you just said being present allows you to bring your tools. So I want to note that to the listeners. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thing to remember. When you're present, you, it releases your tools, but do you also think that that's also letting, letting God flow through you when you do that? Certainly. I mean, in the same way that I said that God is the creator of, of the child's drawing and, and, you know, when somebody tells me a joke, it's equally as true in a conversation where one person is comforting another um, or, uh, you know, being someone, one of the guys presents me with with a scene of just tragedy and I'm and I'm listening I'm praying I'm reaching out for a response for something to say to to just not be overwhelmed by the sadness of the thing that he's presented and when an idea comes into my mind you know I say it and that's certainly you know moment by moment prayer prayer in action and I do think you know in the same way that the child's drawing is God expressing the desire to care or the actual care, like what is that other than like that's God's love being expressed in the zillions of facets of human interaction? Well, wow, that, that is really beautiful. Um, it leads me to what, what I talked to you about, but 
Um, I don't know if many of my listeners know this, but I, I'm a, uh, I am a licensed spiritual coach. And part of our training is to do uh, sessions. We do treatment sessions with people, but it's about sitting and being present. And, and the practice is what you just described. It's sitting and being present to another person, opening yourself up to, to God, spirit, whatever name you have for it, and listening to that inspired message, you know, and I'm sure you've had that experience where you're sitting across from someone and, and you, I would say, once again, the little you, you're like, I don't know how to handle this guy's problems. You know, he's got a history of, of whatever violence or crime, or how do I handle this? And suddenly you hear that voice or do you, do you, do you hear a voice or do you get an impulse? Do you see an image? What is that like for you, Alex? Uh, my sense is that it, it comes in all different kinds of expressions. Um, Maybe in the most amazing moments, it comes in a voice with actual words. I mean, I can think of less than less than you know the fingers on one hand the times that's happened to me, but but certainly you know lots and lots and lots of times that it has come just as a as a thought or um, or a Bible verse or or just a feeling of love for them um, or an image, like you said. I think that's the that's an amazing thing about about this process of, of listening and prayer is being alive to when the answers come um, and not like poo-pooing it. You know, that idea is not good enough. Um, you know, I really have a sense that, that our, our prayer, it's like, a, it's like an, an improvisation, you know, when, when uh, in, an, in an improvised scene, there's no time to say, well, that line wasn't good enough. You know, you, you say yes, and, and you go with it. Um, and that's my, my sense of living this moment by moment listening. Um, when an idea comes, if I've asked for an idea, if I've reached out for an idea, um, I'm really trying hard to recognize it when it comes and embrace it as an answer to that question and then like keep having that situation evolve towards a better outcome i think that for me i i practice that listening when i'm actually creating art you know mm -hmm. that inspired like when that there's this inspiration of what color goes here color goes there hit this take this out add this and there's a con what i call a conversation i'm having a conversation um but i've learned and and i have to admit maybe similar to you, the value of doing it with another person. To me, it, you know, uh, being open to other people and truly being present to the needs of other people. It's to me, it is very rewarding. You know, I think that's why I gravitate towards doing these podcasts, because I'm able to sit and be present to someone and just and listen to how they express and, and also listen to what's in my head and, and responding to that. Um, it's a wonderful process. Certainly, yes. So I think that goes back to the beginning of this uh, podcast where I said that the synchronicity, and that's where there's a synchronicity in life. And we all like to think that everything's random, but I do believe that we are being guided and that everything is, is, is God speaking to us. And whether or not that was that bully on the playground in eighth grade, like you said, every creation is God. So that, that came to me in a certain way, but it taught me something. It taught me how to be stronger. It taught me to have more uh, self-confidence. It also taught me to be sensitive to people that are picked upon. Mm -hmm. You know, so many lessons in that experience. Um, I did find, you know, you reached out to me, I think after you listened to my podcast with John Domont. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. So I found a, a place in the book, which is so similar to John. Um, it's... It's in the chapter called Doing My Best. It's on page 279. And earlier in this conversation, I, I talked to you about practicing seeing God. If uh, Listeners, I think that's such a wonderful practice every day. Look around and see signs of the, the wonders of God. But I'm going to just read this one little chapter. And I did. I remember when I reached out to you, I was like, did you write this just recently? Because the details are so vivid. <laughs> from something that occurred in your life 10, 15 years ago. And so it, you, you obviously have a very good visual memory. I guess that makes sense. But um, here it goes. Then that summer, 
I had the experience I described in the last story. I saw the voice of God speaking in the light, sparkling on the surface of the Jamaica pond. It turned me on in a new way to the holy voice that is speaking around us all the time in nature, light, shadows, just the way everything is. That summer, I was surprised to find my inner compass taking me into the woods in the effort to make realistic, adoring pictures of nature. I wanted to see if I could invite that holy voice into my paintings. I, I, I love that because it does remind me of, I think probably where you had some sort of connection with John's conversation, because he was talking about the boats and light in a harbor and how, how there's such a beauty in it. And he, he, would, he could spend hours just watching the light reflecting on the water. And um, it shows how we are all connected in mm -hmm. our experiences. And mm -hmm. we all have in different ways, right? For sure. And so to me, it sounds like you very much, obviously by a lot of your murals are, are, are nature oriented. Your paintings are about nature. That nature is definitely uh, a key source for you and your connection. Does that sound right? Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has just been a great conversation. Um, like I said, there's so much to share about you. Uh, we didn't even get to touch on your musical career. And <laughs> I, I would invite my listeners to Google your name um, on Spotify. There's a bunch of playlists. I have listened to a lot of your albums while painting. Um, cool. And there's, yeah, which I love. I think that's a wonderful practice. And there's lots of messaging in there. And perhaps we'll have to have you come back and talk about those the messaging in your music. Um, no, I would love it. <laughs> because they're, they're just packed full of information as well. Um, is there mm -hmm. anything you'd like to share with the listeners about your book or about, about this conversation that I haven't covered? Sure. Um, yeah, so this, this book that Chris has so nicely been talking about this whole time, uh, I just released it last fall. Um, and it, it, my, my focus, as, as Chris has been bringing out so nicely, has been to really unpack, you know, the whole spectrum of, um, of experiences that I had and that I think every artist has who's really seriously seeking to do something substantial with their art. Uh, and, and the amazing and very surprising and really exacting uh, uh, things that go on when we try to solve our problems with spirit, you know, really depending upon prayer to solve these problems. Um, and the thing that people have been responding to, and I think Chris brought it out here, is, uh, you know, I've really not tried to spare anything. Um, I, I, I think we, we, I certainly benefit from hearing real stories that that are not sugarcoated, um, that I can relate to because it shows me a bit of my own life, and that's what I've tried to do with this book um, to show that that real victories can be won, but they aren't won without, you know, taking these taking these these sometimes very scary um steps um so it's 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 my hope that it will be useful for for other folks oh well i'm sure it will be like i said uh, it's it's a wonderful intimate uh store uh, book and mm -hmm. and uh, very personal and and you you didn't hold back <laughs> you know and and it, it's it's quite lovely it was quite lovely i enjoyed it that's why i had to read the whole thing before i talked to you um yeah to get to get my hands around it so <laughs> uh and and it's and there's so much conversation in there and i i want to go back to something you said too about um if you don't mind the praying part mm -hmm. um i was raised uh in a, like I said earlier, a Catholic uh, church. And, and I think I've switched my idea of what praying is. And at the time I, I was raised, you know, you sit there and go, dear God, I want a tricycle. Or, dear God, I, and it was every prayer was more like what I want, I want, I want. Um, I don't know how you, how you feel about this and I, I'd love to share this with you, but I've learned that praying is more about listening. 
you know? So when I pray, it's about maintaining my connection to spirit as long as I can and listening to what spirit has to tell me. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that's similar to you or would you add something? I, I really do. Uh, listening is one of the main kinds of, of prayer that I do uh, because I find that it, it, it blesses my life. Um, and I don't think it's at odds with wanting. I think desire is very, very closely related to prayer, connected with prayer. Um, and we listen because we desire. But, you know, we're not going to tell God anything that God doesn't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but we can gain new inspirations, new insights, uh, new ideas um, from that beautiful source by listening and then the ideas are very often just perfectly suited with the desire that we have burning inside of us so they they uh they just go together naturally uh and we sort of have our next steps that's that's my sense of listening for sure oh i love it well thank you well um i i wanted to share one other thing with my listeners is i've started doing some uh i call them intentional meditations um, this interview is not only going to be on Spotify and uh, many other podcast channels, it will also be uploaded to YouTube. So um, under a spirit, the Spiritual Artist Podcast, there is a YouTube channel, and you can follow that to listen to this interview with Alex, but also to listen to um, some in what I call intentional meditations that I'm starting to do, where I help people uh, do a creative journey to kind of remember who they are. Uh, in a meditation format. So I want to thank you, uh, Alex, for joining me and hearing the feedback from this interview is going to be exciting. So thank you. Thank you so much. So nice to be with you, Chris. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Whether you're following the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, make sure you choose the subscribe button so you'll receive new segments when they're released. Plus, check out my new book, The Spiritual Artist, now available on Amazon.com. In the meantime, be still, listen, and know that you are a spiritual artist.